What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And in this episode, we're talking about a very special day in the church year. We're talking about Ash Wednesday. Stick around. So, Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. It's kind of a weird day in that it starts on a Wednesday. Lots of church observances are the Sunday of this, the Sunday of that. Uh, Ash Wednesday is just that. It's a Wednesday. And it's a day that many Protestants just kind of avoid these days. It's a, oh, that's Roman Catholic. I don't have to do that. Well, you're half right. It's not Roman Catholic. It is distinctly historically Christian. But you are right. You don't have to do it. We have freedom in Christ to observe certain traditions that have come down to us. Now, I'm reminded of a verse in Scripture where it makes reference to that great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. And Ash Wednesday is a participation in everything that has gone before us. It is a testimony of that great cloud of witnesses that one generation shall proclaim to the next the goodness of God. So Ash Wednesday starts on a Wednesday because we count back from Easter 40 days, bearing in mind that each Sunday is still the Lord's Day. Each Sunday is still a little celebration of the resurrection. So when we exclude the Sundays in Lent, we get to a Wednesday that's 40 days before. And Sundays in Lent are very different than, let's say, Sundays of Advent. There are four Sundays of Advent. There are so many Sundays in Lent. So Lent is a season of 40 days of what I get. The, the best way to describe it is 40 days of repentant joy. Now, I know that we're all very used to preconceived notions of the Roman Catholic Church and how they, they don't eat meat on Fridays. And sometimes, well, heck, even Lutherans are really good at looking really glum during Lent. And, and if you've participated in a midweek Lenten service or you've gone to church on Sunday, but mainly in those midweek Lenten services, oh my gosh, are those hymns gloomy. And the old um, radio personality Garrison Keillor used to say that Lutherans love to sing their Lenten hymns and be all gloomy and downtrodden. Half right. I love the hymnody of Lent, but not because it's all gloom and doom and sorrow and sin, but because the depth of what Christ has done for me on the cross, the reason that Christ came, every aspect of his life that points us to his cross, the emphasis is the cross, and without a crucified, murdered, dead, and risen Savior, we do not have salvation. So we're coming out of the Christmas and Epiphany season, Christmas being the incarnation of God into human flesh. Epiphany, beginning on January 6th, the season of the revelation that this child in Bethlehem, laid in a feeding trough, is God in human flesh. We know this by the star and the magi. We know this by uh, the miracles that he worked, that wedding at Cana, the healing and the raising of the dead. And of course, always the preaching. And the preaching that was hard for some people to bear. Especially when Jesus said things like, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in you. So this season of epiphany that we're coming out of, this revel well, this epiphany that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And now we come to Ash Wednesday, where the service is distinctly different. The hymns are darker 
deeper, richer, fuller. There's an emphasis on sin and suffering and self-sacrifice. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, follow me, Jesus says. Now, the tradition of Ash Wednesday comes to us from the very ancient church, which had to endure a persecution that we, at least American Christians, cannot understand. Now, there is opposition to our faith, and there is there are, I should say, people in positions of authority over us in the United States that are trying desperately to take away our First Amendment rights to the free exercise of religion. But it's not full-blown persecution yet. But in those first centuries of the church, it was. The best example that I can think of, and it seems so silly to our minds, as anyone who's watched this channel knows, I love burning incense. Incense is a visual and a, a uh, sensory uh, reminder of what prayer is from the psalm. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. We draw our attention to the book of Revelation where the prayers of the saints are the incense that lifts up before the presence of the Lord. But in ancient days, you would offer a pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord, this was your sacrifice, this was your duty. And the Christians would say, no. Caesar may be a Lord above me, but Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So while like my employer is a Lord over me, my parents are a Lord over me, but they have a Lord, the Lord, Christ the Lord, the Lord of lords. And so the Christians would not, would not, under pain of death, offer so much as a pinch of incense and say Caesar is Lord. Many, many Christians in the early church went to horrible deaths because they would not deny Christ before men. Some, however, did not go to horrible deaths. They denied Christ. They apostated. They denied the faith. They were apostate from the church. They were outside of the church. The Jesus who said that if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. This is a very real teaching. And they would deny Christ. But Christ is the mercy of God on that cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so Christ always welcomes back that one wandering sheep. Christ is always leaving the 99 to go after that one lost sheep. And so in the ancient church, the church of the first century, that church that modern Protestants are looking to be a part of, well, that church had a way of inviting people back into the church who had apostated. They would cover themselves in ashes and sackcloth. And they would repent publicly for what very quickly turned into a season of 40 days. Now, new converts to Christianity, they were catechized, taught the Christian faith for that season of 40 days. And on Easter, were brought into full communion with the church by being baptized. So this is where this comes from, especially that imposition of ashes that we are familiar with, where the pastor rubs his thumb in these ashes and oil and makes a cross on our head. And what does he say to us? He says, remember, O man, that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. It's a very... Now, when I go to the altar to meet the pastor... Traditionally, he has bread and wine. Take this and eat. Take this and drink. This is Christ's body. This is his blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is what I'm used to hearing on Sunday, but on Ash Wednesday, when I go up and he rubs my forehead with that smudgy black cross 
And he says, remember, O man, that thou art dust, and to dust you shalt return. The emphasis of the season of Lent begun on Ash Wednesday is we are going to die. The wages of sin is death. We are going to die. And Lent prepares us to face death. Now, there's lots of readings that come to us, especially for Ash Wednesday. It could be Jesus being tempted in the desert, being fasting for 40 days, being tempted and conquering Satan the way Adam and Eve should have when they were tempted by rightly quoting God's word. This is why Christ is the second Adam, because he took on human flesh and was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. There's the verses about fasting and when you fast. And that is my advice to the Protestant. The Bible doesn't say if you fast. It says when you fast. And now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it says not to cover your face, not to be downtrodden, not to show any sort of physical sign that you are fasting. And then what do we do? We go to church on Ash Wednesday. We get this smudgy cross on our forehead. And many Christians wear it throughout the day. The thing about this cross is the ashes, which are composed of the palm branches from the previous Palm Sunday, and we'll get to that in a second. These ashes are a reminder to us that you are dust, you are stained, marred by sin, and you're going to die. But the pastor doesn't just rub ashes on you and say, you're going to die. He says... Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And marks us where? Here, on the forehead. For many faithful Christians, for two millennia, who have had water poured on their head with the mark of the cross upon their forehead and upon their heart to mark them as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. So there is hope and assurance in the imposition of ashes. Our, our, the truth, we're going to die unless... Jesus comes back before I finish this video. We're going to die. And we need to be prepared for that. We need to face that reality. But our hope and our joy is that we have been marked with the cross of Christ and we are one who is declared redeemed by Christ. That is our hope. And you may leave those ashes on if you go to the morning service all day. Some people work during the day and they go in the evening. I actually work during the day, but I have taken PTO for Ash Wednesday to go to the church attached to my son's school to sit with him during the Ash Wednesday service so that he and I together can go up and receive the ashes. And I may or may not leave the ashes on my head when I go back to work. These are not an outward boastful sign of my sorrow and repentance and whether or not I'm fasting. Because the rule, if I can show my age for a little bit, the first rule of Lent Club is that you don't talk about Lent Club. If I choose to give something up, I won't say. If I choose to do something extra or to give extra or to... Um, spend more time in the Word or a devotional book, you won't hear me say it. It's one of the things that very early on in my marriage used to irk my wife to no end. What are you doing for Lent? It's none of your business. But this ashen cross, which comes to us from the ashes of the palm branches from the previous Palm Sunday, and isn't that interesting? These loud hosannas that we sang on Palm Sunday, salvation is coming we would sing these loud hosannas that we would always, we're always going to sing hosanna to the king. No, we're not. We fall immediately into temptation and sin and we betray our faith. We anathematize ourselves when we deny Christ in thought, word, and deed by the things that we do and the things that we don't do. So I think it's entirely appropriate that the church would make ashes out of these palm branches and put them on our foreheads in the hope of the cross, which has marked our foreheads at baptism, when we were buried with Christ into his death and raised with him by the power of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. And my suggestion, and this is just a suggestion, 
If you should choose to embrace your Christian freedom and not wear the ashes all day, my recommendation, and pastors, if you're watching, please start doing this. I think it'd be beautiful. Make sure there's water in the font. And as your, your parishioners are leaving, they may wash their forehead with the water from the font so that that dark stain, that dark blot of sin is washed away by Jesus washing, by his sanctifying of his church with the washing of water and the word. I think reaching it, it, it's just ordinary water. It's not holy water, but drawing water from the baptismal font to wash away the cross on your forehead so that you can go unmarked into the season of Lent so that nobody knows what's going on in here. I think that would be beautiful. I would love to see. I've never seen a church do it. I think it would be lovely to see churches offer that. But Ash Wednesday... I think, I, I don't feel like I've sidetracked into a lecture about baptism. I think Ash Wednesday is incredibly baptismal. If we are preparing for our death by remembering we have died to sin. There's an old, old quote of a, I can't remember his name. It's a very old quote about baptism. If you die before you die. You won't die when you die. Rhetorical nonsense? Maybe. But it's a beautiful thing. And that, I think, that's what, I, it's just what I think about on Ash Wednesday. I think about my baptism. I think about the death that I deserve. I think about the death that was offered up in my place. And I think about the mercy and grace of Christ that has participated me when I sought it not in that death, I have been buried with Christ by baptism into his death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, I too may walk in newness of life. And that if I should die before the Lord returns and my, my flesh is put into the ground, well... There my flesh shall sleep secure. I shall sleep in death with my soul in the eternal presence of God, waiting with joyful anticipation for that day when my flesh will be raised incorruptible, imperishable, or my soul will be united to my body. This is why Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, which is... A day that kicks off a season of, as I said in the beginning, repentant joy. Yes, there must need be sorrow for sin. There must be sorrow for sin. There must be sincere and heartfelt repentance. And yes, there may even be, as it was in ancient days, ashes. And the solemn reminder that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But the cross of Christ is our hope and our comfort. And we have been marked with that cross, buried into his death, and raised with him to newness of life. So for 40 days, beginning at Ash Wednesday, we do sing those sorrowful hymns. We do sing the mystery of the suffering and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And on Easter Sunday, alleluias will ring once again because the church puts away her alleluias in the liturgy, doesn't she? And she changes up her liturgy to reflect the season. She drapes herself in purple. Royalty and repentance. And all of these things that show us this is a season of repentance. But always, because there are little resurrection Sundays throughout Lent, always the hope and the promise of the resurrection. So it is my hope to you that this upcoming Wednesday, you will find a way, find yourself a good, solid, confessional Lutheran church and participate, maybe for the first time, the imposition 
of ashes. That is my sincerest hope for you. And if you choose not to, you are free in Christ to not participate. What you're not free in Christ to do, I would like to remind you, is judge those who do. And to not think in any sort of negative manner about any Christian you might see going about their daily life and their daily vocation with a cross on their head. That's Ash Wednesday. It's a wonderful, beautiful tradition of the church that has been handed down to us from generation to generation that unites us very truly with that faithful cloud of witnesses. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.